Well, every week I get away and uh, I, I do some study and I uh, read a lot and I listen to a lot of things. And when I do that, I have a notebook and I take all my notes. And I take all my notes in these notebooks. And so in my office right now are probably a dozen notebooks full of all my notes I've taken as I prep for sermons. And so I, I fill those out and I, and I put them in my office, rarely ever to go back. But it's one of those things like I just can't get rid of. And then my life suddenly changed this week. I was in a meeting and a guy had this notebook and it looked, it looked a little different than what I had experienced or what I had ever seen. So he started describing what this is. And this is called the rocket book wave. And what it is, is it, it allows you to write in this with a special pen. And then once you have filled it out, you put it in the microwave with a cup of water. And then within about eight minutes, all the ink is gone. And you can reuse this notebook. Now, the, the crazy thing is, because for me, I, I want to keep track of all my stuff. So it's great that it erases. It's, it's great for the environment. I'm going to use this thing several times. But the great thing about it is it's a smart notebook. And so at the bottom are these icons. And you mark an icon. As you scan it, it sends it into the cloud somewhere. It's maybe over some of your heads, technology-wise. This is a little new, I know. Um, I scan the page because I've marked a certain thing. It will send it out as an email to someone. It will save it online. And so forever, right, forever, I'll have these logged online. Now, I, I thought it was interesting as we're talking about Galatians and we're talking about the gospel and we're talking about grace. We're talking about this idea of forgiveness, we're talking about this idea, and I've said this over and over to you, that no matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, that there's this grace, this favor that is put on your life that offers you forgiveness. That your slate, right, your story becomes wiped clean. But here's what I think happens. We may even believe that God forgives us. I think we may even believe that God no longer holds it against us. But I think we hold it against ourselves. That in the back of our mind, we've made copies, uh, that we store these somewhere, we have logged away, and at times we go back and we revisit these things. That we punish ourselves, that we believe that our relationships could never look different because of the decisions I made at some point. And so just like this, just like it gets erased, it's out there somewhere. And for you, I want you to understand that the gospel, the grace of God, not only wipes your slate clean, but he no longer holds it against you. He forgets about it. He doesn't hold on to a copy to, to bring back up once you've asked for forgiveness and you receive that. Paul had committed his life to helping people understand the gospel. Paul hated Christians. He was killing Christians. And then he becomes one. He plants churches. He pours into them. And the main point of Paul's writings was just believe in Jesus. Believe in the power of the gospel. We have spent the last several weeks looking at this idea of what the gospel is and what it's not. That the gospel brings freedom. And what it's not is it's not an opportunity for legalism or license. Grace doesn't mean, well, I can do whatever I want whenever I want because I know God's going to forgive me. There's no freedom in that. And it's not legalism, so we don't add anything to Jesus. We believe that Jesus is enough. So you showing up here today doesn't give you more grace. Grace is available to you. We come here today to be encouraged and equipped. But there's nothing else you need to add to Jesus to actually get the grace of God, that Jesus is enough. And so we, we looked at this idea that we're all broken and in need of God's grace, every one of us. And this brokenness leads to fractures in our lives. It leads to fractures personally, just on our own that other people may never know about. That there's this battle that takes place. The things we want to do, we don't do. The things that we hate, we find ourselves doing and so this brokenness leads to this fracture in our life it leads to a fracture relationship in relationships in our marriage or with our kids with a roommate with a co-worker like this brokenness works itself out not only in our own lives but with other people and then in our community we see this whether it's hate or prejudice or racism or crime or murder whatever it is it all comes back to this place that we are all broken people but what normally happens is we just try and figure out how to fix it how do I become a better me, right? There are literally thousands and thousands of books of how to be the best you. And so we just try and figure out, okay, well, how can I 
fix it. And so in the midst of doing that, we, we go looking for certain things to, to help us in our brokenness, right? We, we try to find our identity in all kinds of different things. So I pray for Delaney that at an early age, she would just find her identity as a little girl who is loved by God. That's it. Because the older we get, we, we think that our success or our promotion or the money that we make or the stuff that we have, we think that is what is going to make us happy. That that becomes our God and what will satisfy us in the midst of our brokenness. But we know it doesn't work. We all know it doesn't work, but yet we always go back to it. And so the good news of the gospel intervenes in the midst of all of those things. When we fully believe, not just with our head, but with our hearts and our lives, that God not only forgives but forgets, that we find ourselves as sons and daughters of a good father, that that is our identity, well, that is good news to us. Everything changes personally in relationships and even in community. And so when we believe in the gospel, we are free. We're free to simply pursue God and to praise him. And so my life, my world, it's based on what I believe. It's the faith I have in the gospel. And the moment my life begins to revolve around me, when, when I become the center, that's when I become frustrated and I become angry and things become out of whack. No one has to teach us this. We've seen this with little kids, right? In the grocery store, the little kid doesn't get the fruit snacks that they want. Right? And they, they throw the fit, maybe even on the ground, and you stand there thinking, I've never told you or taught you how to do that. Right? Where, where does that come from? That, that's just in them. Their life is about them. And as a kid, it's kind of funny, unless it's your kid, but it, it's kind of funny in the, in the moment. But, but, but as we get older, it's not, it's not so funny. It's not so funny that when our world revolves around us, we're, we're unable to, to recognize even what God is doing or we're unable to recognize relationships that we need to pay attention to because life is so focused on us. So here's the amazing thing. When the gospel really works itself out in our lives, not only in our lives, but the lives of people around us, when a group of people are reconciled to God and they begin to do the work of being reconciled to one another, of doing the hard work of, of being together, of being for one another, of seeking forgiveness, of extending forgiveness, that's where you find a group of people who are living a gospel-enabled community. Right? It, it's different than just saying, I'm a part of a church or I go to that church, but like really believing the gospel and it works itself out in our own lives and in our relationships in the church. And so for the last several weeks, we've looked heavily at what it is to believe the gospel. Two weeks ago, we looked at this idea that there's this fruit that begins to be produced in our lives. When we're guided by the Holy Spirit, when we're led by the Spirit, there's some good things that happen. Joy and peace and patience and kind. There's these things that come out of our lives that if you follow Jesus, if you say, I'm being led by God, then, then this fruit is not an option. It should be evident in our, in our lives. And so when we believe in the gospel, we've been changed by the gospel, it's evident. Uh, today we're going to see what happens when the gospel impacts a group of people. How do we live that out as a church? And I say this, and I say this a lot, but you are the church. Uh, this building is not the church. You are. Uh, we were driving this week. We had a youth group in town um, from the Chicago area, and they were here staying at Trinity, and they served in North County and in St. Louis. We have another group coming in, and so... My daughter and I were driving, and she was like, oh, that's a little church. And then she was like, building, church building, right? Because I'm trying to help her to begin to see that the buildings we meet are in are just buildings, yeah. right? The church are us together. Oh, today, we're going to look at five verses. So it's one of the shortest uh, chunks we've looked at in this whole thing, but I think it is super important. We're going to really look at just a few details of how we live out the gospel with one another uh, next week, I'm going to be gone on vacation with my family. Next week, uh, my good friend Lenny Barber, uh, you guys have heard Lenny a few times. Uh, you won't want to miss next week. Uh, Lenny's going to be here. And then the next week, uh, my friend Jake Austin. Uh, Jake is the guy uh, with Shower to the People. Um, and we've talked about Shower to the People. It's the mobile shower truck. He's going to be here. And if you notice, you have to be bald and facial hair to uh, preach at, at Trinity. That's a requirement. 
Uh, but you don't, if you are, if you are around, uh, you're going to want to be here. Uh, Lenny and Jake are both incredible people doing really great things, and I want you to hear from them. Uh, when I get back from vacation, we'll have two more weeks of Galatians and we'll be done. Thank you for crawling through this with me. Uh, this has been, I think, one of the most important things we've worked through. Because if we don't understand the gospel, nothing else really matters. That at the end of this, hopefully you can say what the gospel is and what the gospel isn't. And if you don't, please come ask. I want to make it extremely clear that you and I are broken. We've been separated by God from God. But through Jesus, we can be reconciled and restored because of grace and grace alone. That's the gospel. Now, how does it impact us? If you're not a follower of Jesus today, uh, this hopefully will give you a clear picture of what the church could look like. If you are, uh, this is the work that we are supposed to be doing with one another and for one another. I'm going to read Galatians 6, 1 through 5, and then I'll go back and, and talk about three main things. It says this, Brothers, if someone is caught in a sin, you who are spiritual should restore him gently. But watch yourself, or you also may be tempted. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Each one should test his own actions. Then he can take pride in himself without comparing himself to somebody else, for each one should carry his own load. Verse 1, brothers, if someone is caught in a sin, you who are spiritual should restore him gently, but watch yourself or you also may be tempted. I think Paul is specifically talking about someone who would confess to be a follower of Jesus. Uh, Paul, in a, in a couple different places, makes it pretty clear that, that when we're supposed to correct or even judge, uh, we judge people within the church, not outside the church. That those who don't know God or follow Jesus, our expectations and thoughts of them are different than those who confess to follow Jesus. So Paul is saying here, if you know someone who is a follower of Jesus, who is caught in a sin, you who are spiritual should restore him gently. Now, uh, this idea of being caught doesn't mean that we go around looking for people who are living in sin. It's not the sin police. It's not a detective. We don't try and figure out what's going on in people's lives or in their relationships. No, see, your job and my job isn't to seek out and try and find the problems people are going through. Our job is to come near to, to be friends of those who are struggling. This isn't about being busted or busting someone. In college, Danny, who was just up here and we, uh, with dedicating Delaney, we went to high school together and we went to college together. And Danny drove an old Honda Accord that he bought for a dollar. And uh, there was one evening he had gone to bed and some friends of ours uh, went and got Danny's little Honda Accord and we pushed it into the lobby of the dorms. Uh, the doors opened, we pushed it into the lobby of the dorms. So as people were coming home that night, there's a car sitting in the lobby. Well, the next morning as Danny is asleep, campus security comes knocking on Danny's door. And he says, uh, could, you, could you explain or tell me why your car is in the lobby? See, his job as a security guard is to investigate, to bust whoever did wrong, to seek out and find. That, that is not what Paul is saying here. But Paul is saying, in a better language even than caught, do you see someone who's drowning around you? Do, do you see someone who is entangled or ensnared by something? Do you see someone who needs you to reach into their world and help bring them up, to restore them back to where they're supposed to be? Uh, when Kennedy, my 12-year-old, was really little, like around two, she was doing swim lessons. And at White Birch Pool, they stood on these little platforms. And I was sitting there watching Kennedy out with the lifeguard, and I look down, and I see a little girl slip off of the platform. And she slips off and she goes under. And I kind of look around waiting for a lifeguard or someone else to come around. And no one's moving. And so I run down to the edge of the pool and I reach down to the bottom of the pool and I grab this little girl and pull her out. She on her own could not get out. She was drowning. She needed someone to intervene. And so Paul is saying there might be people in your life that are drowning. They're entangled, they're ensnared, and they have no way out. 
And he says, you who are spiritual should restore them gently. So who does it? Well, he's not saying those who are super mature in their faith. He's not saying the varsity Christians. If we go back just what we looked at two weeks ago, what he's saying is those who are led and guided by the Spirit. Those who the fruit of the Spirit are evident where you're having love and joy and peace come out of your life that you who are spiritual see someone who's drowning and you go to them and you try and help them. This means that there isn't any alternative motives, no agendas, no hope in causing harm or shame. See, the danger is that when our responsibility is to go around calling everyone out that makes a mistake, then we begin to forget who God is in our own lives. Uh, Paul is not talking about here the occasional mistake. Uh, He's not talking about knowing someone who kind of in a moment says something they shouldn't have. They were angry. They hurt you. Uh, That's not what Paul, Paul is talking about someone who habitually is doing something, who basically has given up. And again, they are drowning. He says, you who are spiritual, being led by the spirit, who are compassionate and caring, you should go to them and help them. See, love is the radical way of helping people before they become ensnared by their sins. Uh, 1 Peter 4, 8 says this, Above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. I think if you love people well in the midst of their slip-ups and mistakes when they sin against you, if you love them well and extend grace, maybe that would keep them from drowning in the long run. But what we're talking about are those who have given up, where there seems to be drowning taking place. And Paul is clear who should do it. Not someone who is out for the person looking to punish or hurt people, their reputation, but someone who is being guided by the spirit of God. Someone who cares deeply about the other person, who has a relationship with that person. Now let's just be honest. That seems really hard, right? It seems hard if we see someone who is struggling to to go to them because we we have this idea that we don't want to come across as judgmental, right? We Who are we to to call out someone else? But if you're being led by the Spirit, if you have a relationship and you're close to the person who is drowning, there is a need for you to intervene. The language is really strong here. This isn't someone who has just slipped up. It is someone who is drowning. It's not someone who is just kind of sitting in the kiddie pool, but they are sitting at the bottom of the deep end of the pool. And unless someone helps them out, They have no way out. Now, let me say, God intervenes and works in miraculous ways, but there's this invitation to the church. There's this invitation to us in relationships to help people. So if you're being led by the Spirit to restore someone who is caught in sin and drowning, Paul says you're to restore them gently. That doesn't mean calling them out in front of others. It doesn't mean posting online. It doesn't mean to do it in a harsh way where we try to punish but it's to do it in a loving, gentle way. At the end of verse one, Paul says, but watch yourself or you also may be tempted. Now, what is the temptation? It's not a temptation to sin like they are. No, I think it's the temptation to forget the gospel. I think it's a temptation to forget that you and I are in need of God's grace as well. That that without God's grace, without Jesus, that we are in that same place. See, the moment we think we're superior to someone because they sin differently than us is the moment we fail to recognize our own need for grace. If we begin to see, well, I'm not as bad as they are. I'm not like them. I don't do what they do. We have failed to recognize our own need for grace. So the point of restoring is not to show how mature you are or how spiritual you are, but is to show your care and concern. And the best way we're able to do this is through the fruit of the Spirit, to be patient, to be faithful to people. Those are the things that help us do this gently. So after prayer, after being led by God, maybe you just set up a time to speak to one another, that you you share your concern, that you've noticed something, and just to ask, is everything okay? I'm worried. From that point, you begin to navigate through the conversation with wisdom and grace, and you walk alongside with them. Remember, the goal is restoration with God and with others. No shame 
or punishment. Your job is not to go around handing out judgments. You're not disciplining people. You're helping people because you care. Now, what if you're the one drowning? Right? As hard as it may be to approach someone else who seems to be drowning, the idea of someone to come to us and call out something that's going on in our lives doesn't seem that appealing. Right? And so I think there's a couple things that we often do, and I want to encourage you not to do these things. Don't just find someone who's going to tell you what you want to hear. So if you have a close friend who says, hey, I'm seeing this in your life. Is everything okay? Don't leave there and go find someone and say, hey, this is what they said. Just looking for them to tell you what you want to hear. And then don't look for their faults. That's going to be the other temptation. As someone tries to help us and walk with us, the moment we begin to say, well, who are you? You make mistakes too. Yeah, they do. And hopefully if they're being led by the Spirit, they understand the grace of God. So in this gospel community, when we see others drowning, we remember the gospel and the power of grace, and we reach out and we're there for others. What else does the church do? Those changed by the gospel. Verse 2. It says, we carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. Not only do we reach out to those who are drowning, but we also recognize others who are carrying, carrying heavy burdens and are being crushed beneath them. See, a burden is something that is too heavy for one person to carry alone. Xander's going to come up and, and help me for a second. See, when we recognize that there's other people around us who are in pain, that they're hurt, it's our responsibility to do what is within our power to help carry that burden. So, uh, Xander, I just need you to pick up that ball real quick. <laughs> try, just try really hard. Oh, you moved it. Wow. That's actually really impressive that she just, uh, that she just moved, she moved that. See, when we recognize, if I see that Xander is struggling with something, and I just stand here and think, man, that's really difficult, Xander. That stinks that you're going through that. But when I have the power to intervene, right, I have the, the opportunity to not only see her struggling, but I can actually lift it, right? Not easily, but I can lift it, right? And so then what happens is Xander and I lift it together, right? And Xander's not on her own. I'm bearing the weight of her burden with her. And sometimes this could take a really long time. Sometimes this could be weeks or months or years. Maybe it's a short time that we carry this burden together. But the moment I see Xander struggling and I do nothing, I'm not loving. And the, the other tip is I, I have to do something to help carry the burden. I can't see her struggling over there and stay over here. No, I have to get near to her. Right? The only way I can help Xander is to be by her, to be with her. Paul's very clear. You reach out and you grab people who are drowning and you help restore them gently. And then you look around and you see people who are overwhelmed by the burdens in their life. And you just simply say, can I carry that with you? Can I, can I help support you? All right, you can sit down right there. Can I, can I come alongside and help you? These could be burdens, financial, emotional, relational, spiritual. When we do these things, Paul says, you're fulfilling the law of Christ. What's the law of Christ? To love your neighbor as you love yourself. This is what Jesus lives out when he's here. His great love for people, that when he sees people carrying a burden, he doesn't stiff arm them, he doesn't remove himself from the situation, he comes alongside them and he helps carry their burden. Maybe this could be the burden of raising a child alone, it's sickness, maybe it's divorce or death. And I can't tell you how to always carry someone's burden, but the thing I know is that it's not an option. And it doesn't mean you have to have money to always help people, but your time, your energy, a kind word. I mean, one of my favorite things about being a part of this church is I think we do this pretty well. Whether it's meals or sitting with someone in the hospital, maybe it is blessing someone with money or watching kids in times of need. It's words of encouragement. I think this happens here. But here's the other thing I'm starting to realize. Sometimes those who are carrying these burdens don't ever tell anybody they're carrying these burdens. And so what the church is supposed to do is help carry burdens, but 
you may not be allowing other people to carry burdens with you. That if there's struggles, if there's addictions, if there's worry, if there's anxiety, if there's fear, if there's a problem at home, if no one knows, they can't carry the burden with you. So I think at some point, all of us, myself included, we have to believe that we can tell people about our burdens. That maybe when the gospel intervenes in people's lives, when the gospel changes people's lives, when we hear about the burdens people are carrying, and we're able to walk with them, that we're able to come near to them. Now again, verse 3, it says, If anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Paul is saying, look, you're, you're not too important for this. He, he's not saying you're, you're not able to be so consumed with yourself that you'll never be in need. That you may not have a burden that someone else may need to help you carry. That you're deceiving yourself if you believe you could never be under the weight of a burden. See, we're all just one bad decision, whether it's ourself or someone else. It's a bad test result. It's the news of loss. It's a lost job. We're just maybe one decision or step away from needing someone to help carry our burden. And Paul is saying, look, when the gospel actually acts itself out in people's life, we reach in and grab people who are drowning, and then we carry the load, we carry the burdens that other people are going through. See, I think that this is the role of the church and I actually think that those outside the church, when they see a community of people who carry one another's burdens, they'll begin to say, there's something different about them. There's something different about them that they truly care for one another, that they love each other well. Verse 4. It says, each one should test his own actions. Then he can take pride in himself without comparing himself to somebody else. For each one should carry his own load. Now, this sounds a little confusing, and I'll get to that, but at the very beginning, he says, test your actions and take pride in yourself. What he's saying is you begin to boast in what God is doing in your life. What is God saying to you or asking you to do, and you begin to do it. We take pride because we are doing what God has asked us to do. But then this, this one phrase in here, that he can take pride in himself without comparing himself to somebody else. I think it's hard sometimes for us to really see what God is doing in our own lives because we're always looking to see what he's doing in someone else's. This is one of the greatest temptations that I have as a pastor. That, that through social media, as I follow certain pastors and I see what they're doing or what's been done, and there's this temptation of, can I really take pride in what God is doing because I'm comparing myself with someone else? And that's not just me. I think that's you as well. You may not feel like you're doing great things for God because you know someone else who's doing a lot more than you. Paul is saying you take pride in what God is doing without comparing yourself to anybody else. Just look at yourself. Just measure yourself against God's standards. Just measure yourself with what God has called you to do. Are you being obedient? Are you running from God? Has he asked you to do something and you're failing to do it? Has he asked you to restore someone and you're like, eh, I don't think I can do that. Has he asked you to carry the burden of someone? You're like, I don't have time. Like we take pride in what God is doing in us and through us because we're faithfully responding to the call that he's put on our lives. Paul says, you test your actions. Why are you restoring? Why are you carrying burdens? You take pride in what God is doing in and through you, not comparing yourself to anybody else. And then he says, you carry your own load. This seems confusing because we just spent all this time talking about carrying other people's burdens. And then we feel like, well, can other people not carry my burdens? No, no, no. See, Paul is saying you have this load, right? So there's a huge difference between burden and load. A burden is something that you cannot carry on your own. If I brought Xander back up right now, she could lift this, no problem. Her responsibility is her load, not her burden. Now, what is a load? The load is taking responsibility for what God has called you to do. It's doing the thing that only you can do. You have to give an account for your own load. What has God called you to do for an occupation, as a spouse, as a parent, as a neighbor? 
That is your responsibility. That is your load that Paul says you have to carry that. Uh, we're we're uh, sold our house. We're buying a house uh, only like 10 minutes away from where we live now. And we had to have this inspection done. And the, the guy who came and inspected the house, he found out I was a pastor, which I'm always a little hesitant to tell people I'm a pastor because I never know how people will respond. There's lots of different responses I get to that. Um, but pretty quickly, he found out I was a pastor. And this is what he said. Oh, man, I wish I could do what you do. He was like, man, I, I, you know, I go to these homes. He's done thousands and thousands of inspections. He's working with different people. It's like, I wish I could just go sit in an office and read and study all the time. And I was like, well, it's not necessarily the only thing I, uh, I do. But this was my thought. I think this guy, this guy has been called to do something very differently than what I've been called to do. So the moment he goes and does that when he's not supposed to, and the moment I quit doing what I'm supposed to to go be an inspector, I'm not carrying my load. I am not doing what God has called me to do. We cannot trade, listen, we cannot trade what God has called us to do for something anybody else could do. If you're married, you have a responsibility to your spouse. That, that is no one else's responsibility. If you're a parent, it is your load to faithfully disciple and lead your kids to who God is. The church equips and encourages, but that is your load. What has God called you to do in your life? Because here's the truth. If you've walked into this place, like, I don't know if I believe in God, there's a call on your life. You may not know it, you may not believe it, but every one of us, God has called us to to something. And the moment we understand what that is and we recognize that and we don't do it, we're not carrying our load. We're not being faithful to what God has for us. So this is the picture of the gospel community. Being able to recognize those who are drowning and helping to restore them out of love and compassion to do it gently. It's willing to carry burdens that people have as long as needed. And each one of us carrying our own load, being faithful to what God has called us to here and now. All of this is a beautiful picture of a community of the church doing what God has called us to do. That we are not alone. That church is so much more than just coming and sitting and hearing me talk for 30 minutes on a Sunday morning. The church is building relationships with one another. Greg's going to come up, and as he does, I just I think about people sometimes who just go through such difficult things in their life, and they have no one around them to help them. I believe that if you're here today and you're dealing with something, there is a group of people who would love to carry that burden with you. That in the church, you're not alone. You're not alone. And maybe you're drowning, and no one has reached out, and maybe you making a step when this shouldn't happen, but maybe you saying, look, I'm drowning and I need help. A group of people would love to come alongside of you and help restore you and guide you and walk with whatever you're going through. And the only way we're able to do this is because of the gospel, because we understand our own brokenness and our own need for grace in our lives. If you've never received that grace, maybe today's the day. You've never recognized that God loves you and cares for you, that he not only wipes everything you've done wrong, he wipes it clean, but he also forgets and he no longer holds it against you. That is good news. Maybe today you'd accept that. Would you stand as I pray and we'll sing together. God, I want to be a part of a group of people that do that, who live that out. Would you help us, Lord, to to restore one another gently when we see our brothers and sisters struggling? God, would you help us to be the kind of people who look around and we see the burdens that people have and that we step in and we get near to those who are carrying burdens and we take some of the weight off of them. Lord, would you help us to do that? And then would you help us to be responsible for our own load? Whatever you've called us to do, whatever field that looks like, whatever occupation, as a, a parent, as a roommate, whatever you've called us to right now, would we be responsible for that? Would we be faithful to what you've called us to do? Lord, I believe the way we change a whole community is by the church living out the gospel with one another. Would you help us to do that? I pray in Jesus' name.